we would like to move to our next session. This next session is themed NCD Care and Equity and is titled Chronic Kidney Disease and Equitable Care in Relation to CKD. Our speaker is Dr. Susina Alexander. We invite you, ma'am. We also invite Dr. Vinoy David to moderate this session. Thank you. Thank you all. Coming to the next session on CKD and CKDU, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sushin Alexander. She's a professor and head of unit of Nephro 3, as well as the vice principal for research. Her pet project that she has taken up is Gromulon disease, and she's taken up another one, genetics and nephrology. She's got multiple grants that have been taken aboard, and her hard work is one of the first publications of GRACE on IG and nephropathy among the Southeast Asian group. And she has other multiple ones on going on FSGS and also, God willing, taking it up to the mission hospitals as well. So over to you, Sushina, for your talk. Thank you, Anoy, for that kind introduction. Greetings to Christ be all glory. Right, so I'm going to focus on uh, neglected NCD care. And this talk is titled Chronic Kidney Disease and Equitable Care in Relation to CKDU. Now, for those of us who are oblivious to the global burden of chronic kidney disease, about 850 million people around the world are currently affected by different types of kidney disorders. The global prevalence is 11 to 13%. And whether you are from a high income, middle income, or low income, in all economies, the prevalence is increasing annually. There's about five, more than 5 million deaths annually attributable to the lack of access to kidney disease treatment. And as per the WHO projection, kidney disease, chronic kidney disease is the fifth most common cause of death or years of life lost globally uh, by 2040. What about the burden in our region? According to the Global Burden of Disease Study in 2017, 435 million adults in Asia have chronic kidney disease. 70% of them are resident in India or, or China. And South Asia in the Asian uh, subcontinent has surpassed all the other regions with 13.5% prevalence. If you take two time points, even in India, within India, there's been a 38% increase in the proportion of death attributable directly to kidney disease. Kidney disease uh, is, uh, chronic kidney disease is an example for inequity. It is exacerbated in populations where there's lack of access to primary health care and essential medications. It disproportionately affects the vulnerable population and impoverishes them. All of us sitting here do know that there are traditional risk factors for kidney disease, which is diabetes and hypertension. But many of the healthcare professionals themselves are not aware of the non-traditional risk factors for kidney disease. This is also known as chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology or CKDU. From the perspective of health economics, chronic kidney disease is a leading cause of catastrophic health expenditure. By catastrophic health expenditure, it means an out-of-pocket expense of more than 40% of the household income. Even in high income countries, 3% of the healthcare budget goes towards supporting patients on dialysis and transplant, which, is, which represents only 0.03% for them. We don't have equivalent figures for India, but you can just imagine the staggering numbers. Well, what is chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology? I would say you can say it as chronic kidney disease of disadvantaged populations. They usually occur 
in isolated, predominantly rural, agrarian or non-agrarian regions of the world. Presently, as of current, it has been reported from El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica from Central America, Egypt and Tunisia from the African continent, and the Sri Lanka and India uh, from the Asian continent. Uh, we should also not confuse with the various terms that are being described for this disease, and they all point to the same entity. So chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology is also known as CKD of undetermined etiology. Because it was first uh, described in Central America, it's also known as Mesoamerican nephropathy, Sri Lankan nephropathy, and also named after the Uddanam region in Andhra Pradesh in India called the Uddanam nephropathy. So the first report came out from Central America in uh, 2002, and this was due to an observation of an astute clinician who realized that about two thirds of people who are being registered newly for dialysis in a hospital did not have an identifiable cause for kidney disease. In India, though we knew well back in 1900s that there are many kidney diseases for which there is no etiology, it was well described as an entity only back in 2015. And there are many regions now that are CKDU hotspots. Uh, by hotspots, we mean a prevalence of more than 10 to 12% of CKDU in that particular community. Udanam was the first one. Udanam is a agricultural coastal region, which is located in Andhra Pradesh in the Srikakulam as well as in the Prakasam districts of Andhra Pradesh. Mostly the workers here are coconut and cashew plantation workers. It's also been described from the Kanakona region, which is again South Goa. Here uh, it's a tribal population and they are mostly engaged in cashew, pla uh, cashew plantations and they are exposed to high ambient temperature in the heated furnaces. The Marathwada region also has reported uh, that recently there was a Tonde Mandalam region, which is uh, in Tamil Nadu near the Kadalur area, where again it was reported among the agricultural manual laborers. We have a huge pocket in Katak. I personally know that there are certain mission hospitals within our mission network, like the Bisam Katak Hospital, who have uh, really recognize this as a need of their community where there's a burgeoning uh, 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 CKDU population in the community which needs to be well studied and documented. This does not mean that there are no other hotspots. It just means that it's completely underestimated in India and we are in a dire need to discover more hotspots. Now, what is the relation of CKDU in terms of the total CKD population in India. This again is mind blowing, because if you look at two timelines, 2006 to 2010, as well as 2010 to 2014, you can observe that CKDU has overtaken the traditional risk factors for chronic kidney disease in these populations. So we, though most of the NCD care is directed towards the control of diabetes, hypertension, and subsequently the decrease in kidney care, I think there is a need for re-looking at policies because CKDU as well as non-traditional risk factors are an emerging major cause for kidney disease. And kidney disease has in turn, has, uh, is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease as well as death. Now, just a comparison between the different regions in India where the CKDU has been reported. The Tonde Mandalam uh, region, the Uddanam region, and the Khatak uh, are all community studies, whereas that Pondicherry is a hospital-based cross-sectional study. In almost all the places, it is more than 50% of the CKD population and even goes up to two-thirds of the CKD population. 
they are usually seen more in the agricultural communities, but non-agrarian communities also are not exempt as seen in Katak. Some of the common characteristics for us to recognize this entity is it's usually seen in young and middle-aged adults, mostly males. They are engaged in very strenuous work. Uh, there is a minimal or no proteinuria, unlike a diabetic renal disease. They're usually non-diabetics. So diabetic is an exclusion criteria, especially if it's uh, the kidney involvement is due to diabetes. They have normal or mildly elevated blood pressures. It's a progressive disease. And the kidney biopsy is generally shows tubular atrophy or interstitial fibrosis. We'll dwell a little bit deeper into the clinical features. Most of the uh, features, most of the adults are asymptomatic till a later stage. So that's why the detection of CKDU is difficult unless you actively screen for them. And many of them will have vague symptoms or non-specific symptoms like loss of appetite, lethargy, backache, arthralgia, cramps. These might be because they are losing sodium, potassium, and all the other elements in their urine. There can be urinary symptoms. There can be concomitant neurological abnormality if the CKDU is attributable to some heavy metal poisoning and uh, normal liver enzymes. In urine, you can have elevated levels of uric acid, uh, loss of sodium, magnesium, phosphorus, and calcium. Uh, it's usually non-albuminuric proteinuria. That means it is low molecular weight proteinuria, which is not getting reabsorbed by the normal tubules because the tubules are not functioning well. So they, it leads to the leakage of low molecular weight protein in the urine. There is hyperuricemia, which again is a surrogate marker for dehydration and hyperosmolality, and there is hyponatremia and hypokalemia due to the salt loss. Ultrasound typically is small kidneys that are echogenic and can have irregular margins. This is a study which looked at the ultrastructural changes that is in the uh, kidney biopsy tissue of patients who presented with symptomatic CKDU. And most of the ultrastructural changes were limited to the tubules and interstitium, and it spared the glomeruli. So this is an LM which shows from right to left, the mild, uh, the right picture shows mild tubular atrophy. The middle one shows uh, active inflammatory sediments uh, in the tubules and interstitium, and the left picture shows completely atrophied tubules. If you look at the electron microscopic picture, again, the right one shows preserved glomeruli. There is no foot process effacement. The middle picture shows staining of uromodulin in tubular casts. And the left picture shows the completely atrophied, uh, atrophied uh, tubular cells with vacuolization and uh, changes in mitochondria. Kidney disease can be classified from stage one to two based on the level of proteinuria and based on the uh, uh, glomerular function change or glomerular filtration rate. Most of the CKDU that have been described from all these regions belong to the early stages, uh, which is depicted in light blue and red color. So it is stage one and stage two in most of the regions. And this again highlights the fact that there is an important need for us to pick up this disease for primary and secondary prevention. So what are the risk factors? One of the risk factors is heat stress, especially in, uh, in uh, occupations where they are um, exposed to high ambient temperature and humidity. There is uh, significant dehydration, hyperosmolarity, which leads to renal uh, contraction and reduction in GFR. Now, when they are exposed to repeated incels of uh, these incels, it progressively leads to renal fibrosis and glomerulosclerosis. Groundwater consumption, especially when the groundwater is uh, 
in regions where there are shallow wells and the groundwater is contaminated. Uh, this has been uh, associated in uh, the Uddanam region where they have found high levels of silica and high levels of strontium. Uh, even in the Kanakana region in Goa, uh, there is a study which looked at the levels of silica in two villages and it was found to be elevated. Agrochemical exposure, especially fertilizers that use uh, glyo, uh, glyphosate, glyphosate. Uh, this uh, was shown to be associated with the Sri Lankan nephropathy. We've not had, uh, our studies have not shown uh, association with this in India as yet, but definitely in Sri Lanka, they were able to show a relation of the usage of this fertilizer with CKDU. Heavy metals like cadmium, mercury, lead uh, have all been attributed to CKDU. Again, uh, we have not found an association in the Indian regions as of now. Traditional medicines, especially in Tunisia, they have found the use of uh, okra toxin, which is a mycotoxin in the plants. Okra toxin A uh, was found to be elevated in patients who reported this condition. There are also uh, Hanta virus uh, has been associated with this disease in Sri Lankan nephropathy. And there are other exacerbating factors that could uh, promote CKDU, uh, which could be a genetic polymorphism in some of the tubular transport genes or in uh, CYP uh, A1 uh, gene, or the use of uh, NSAIDs or nephrotoxic medications. So we need to know that this is not a single factor. It could be a combination of multiple factors. And as the factors increase or as the factors combine, the severity can change from mild to moderate to severe. Also, there, is, there are exacerbating factors related to aging, uh, AKI, and behavior. So though uh, there are common characteristics for this disease, we also need to realize that there are subtle differences from one region to the other. For example, in Central America, it is more seen in uh, between 20 to 40 years, male predominant, and uh, they uh, have uh, sugarcane or uh, banana as a farming. In Sri Lanka, it is older age group, it is 30 to 50 age group, which is also true in India. But Sri Lanka is uh, surprisingly, it's female predominant disease. And they're usually seen in paddy field workers who are exposed to high ambient temperature. In the Uddanam region in uh, Andhra Pradesh, they are mostly involved with cashew or coconut or rice farming. Now, the, though uh, there is a myth that CKD is not preventable, but that's not true. The onset as well as the progression of CKD is preventable. Now let's look at some of the other aspects that may contribute to CKD. A pregnant woman who are exposed to toxins or who ex environmental conditions can cause, uh, can lead to altered renal programming and development of kidney in the fetus, which again is a risk factor and one of the uh, risk factors which will uh, contribute ultimately to uh, a progression of kidney disease. Uh, in India, the UN uh, Relief Organization has documented that 28% of children born have a birth weight of less than 2.5 kilos. Now we need to be cognizant of the fact that 60% of our nephrons developed during the third trimester of pregnancy up to 36 weeks. There is no new nephron after you're born. In full-term pregnancies with low birth weight, you lose about 20% of your nephron at birth. So you are born with a very low nephron endowment. And uh, this plays a huge role in subsequent years uh, when you are exposed to other multiple risk factors. So clinical interventions that you can provide to, mater to pregnant women as well as in the perinatal period 
can also be labeled as primordial prevention of CKDU. So you, whether you correct maternal malnutrition, uh, decrease a protein deficiency, uh, give a dietary salt restriction, correct vitamin A or vitamin D deficiency, all these maneuvers they will help in improving the nephron number and the child being born with a full endowment of nephron and decreases the risk of CKD and ESRD later in his life. We should also be aware that there are social determinants of kidney health. Uh, there can be government policies uh, that will facilitate dialysis, transplant, that will enforce laws against organ trading. Neighborhood and environment can play a role uh, at, in terms of pollution, housing conditions, heavy metal exposure, and risk to infectious disease causing poor sanitation and AKI. There is an inverse relationship with incident CKD and development of uh, uh, CKD development and education. Health coverage plays an important role, especially uh, for programs that require screening and monitoring, as well as uh, uh, for improving the population physician density ratio. Social and community context and economic abilities are the other social determinants. So kidney health is for everyone, everywhere. It has to be an equitable access with primordial, primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of prevention. So if you can take one message from this talk, is that prevention of kidney disease is highly cost effective, unlike what is perceived, but requires a multi-sectorial holistic approach. A uh, little bit uh, talk on the sustainable development goals. Now, sustainable development goals are goals by the WHO, and it has replaced the Millennium Development Goals. And the countries worldwide are expected to achieve it uh, by 2030. Now, how does it impact kidney health, uh, especially for the sociologists and for the community medicine practitioners here? We know that health has two perspectives, naturalist and normative. Normative is any physical or psychological thing that uh, affects the well-being of a person, is uh, the normative perspective. And it is a normative view that's most important for the prevention of NCDs. And if you look at each as, uh, sustainable development goal, each of them have an impact on kidney disease risk and helps can help to improve early diagnosis and treatment. So if we can club this into six transformational SDG goals for kidney health, the first is education, gender, and inequality. And I'll just list it. I'm not going too much into detail of it, but all these domains will help in improving kidney health. This is a spider diagram which shows the availability of basic diagnostic care in uh, different economies. So the outer two circles are the high and the upper middle income countries. The inner two circles are for the low and the low middle income countries. Now, if you can look at the diagram closely, even facilities, simple facilities like creatinine, or EGFR measurement or urine protein assessment is not present in the low-income countries. And this disparity is further exaggerated when you look at the secondary or the tertiary level cares of these economies. The other domain, uh, SDG domain, that can improve kidney health is health, well-being, and demography, which comprises of SDG 1, 3, and 17. Even non-health SDG transformation goals like energy, decarbonization, and sustainable industry, sustainable food, land, water, and oceans, sustainable cities and communities, digital revolution for sustainable development, all have a direct impact on kidney health. Just to highlight a little bit more of inequity uh, for NCD care. The NCD action plan by UN uh, which uh, was in 2018, I think, they listed 
uh, five main domains for NCD care, which was cardiovascular disease and stroke, chronic respiratory disease, cancer, diabetes, and mental health. Kidney disease is missing from this domain, partly because the burden has not been recognized and partly because the perception is that the kidney disease is too expensive to treat in low-income countries. So we need, there is a dire need to integrate CKD prevention into the national NCD programs. An example of this is the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative. And it's a very ambitious program where they are planning to reduce the number of Americans developing the end-stage kidney disease by 25% by 2030. There's also in Mexico, a nurse-led multidisciplinary program. And this has also reported better preservation in glomerular filtration rate and improvement in the quality of care of kidney disease patients. Now, how do we identify these uh, subsets in our population? There are different ways to go about it. Passive surveillance is when you look registry information. Active surveillance can be sentinel or in selected occupations. Population-based surveillance uh, uses the WHO steps uh, for, uh, that's been developed for NCDs and also through non-health databases like environmental surveillance. Currently, population screening, whole population screening is not recommended for CKD. It is mostly sentinel surveillance or high-risk screening of high-risk groups of CKD in disadvantaged population. It can be done very simply by using two tests. The first one is a urine test. It can be a dipstick to detect proteins. And the second one is to estimate creatinine and estimate the, uh, to uh, measure creatinine and to estimate the glomerular filtration rate. Physicians, nurses, paramedical staff, and other trained healthcare professionals are all eligible to do this screening test. And they can further be staged based on this algorithm that is given into the different stages of kidney disease. So integrated kidney care is important to reduce CKD burden, especially in the scenario of CKDU. We need to improve the working condition of farmers, have access to clean drinking water, changes in agricultural practices, promote awareness, and have secondary and tertiary prevention algorithms. We definitely have multiple challenges. There is uh, limited resources. Uh, there is inadequate health structure. There are accessibility issues. There are not enough medical professionals. And there's uh, health systems are not geared to handle this. Especially when you look at CKDU, the research is very heterogeneous, inconsistent, and varies by region. Another barrier has been, there's, not, there's been a, a, not a uniform case definition for CKDU and CKDU hotspot, but this has been uh, um, overcome by uh, many bodies by releasing uh, region-specific definitions. The ascertainment of causality is not hindered by the absence of, is hindered by the absence of prospective cohort studies. Biological samples, uh, toxins uh, may not, uh, accurately reflect the tissue burden. And we have to consider the possibility of additive effect of two or more risk factors. So there is need for well-designed long-term prospective observational studies using standardized protocols and tools, multidisciplinary team, robust community-based surveillance uh, to find novel endemic areas of CKDU. And uh, because we have such a collaboration, it is not impossible to do this in future. Thank you. Thank you, Sushina, for that very comprehensive talk on CKDU. We'd be happy to take questions and uh, clarify any concerns that the delegates have. Yeah. Yes. So they have found high levels of silica and strontium, especially in the Uddanam regions. 
heavy metals have been found but uh, in india it has not been seen to be associated with ckdu but yes in sri lanka they have found association lead Scots of Bangalore. So actually, in the Odisha region, that is, uh, it's a very, uh, it's not a well-researched area because of multiple socio-demographic reasons. Especially the South Odisha, the the region that borders the Chhattisgarh and the North Andhra Pradesh, which is uh, quite Naxal-prone. Uh, there, they are uh, exposed to a lot of mining. And there is heavy contamination of the groundwater there. Yeah, and there are also uh, certain parts of uh, our country in rural areas where there are very high incidence of uh, renal stones, calculi. And uh, yeah, but yeah, in yeah. this entity, renal stone is an exclusion. Ah. So this is not a renal stone disease. This is yeah. uh, purely no a tubulo interstitial disease, yeah. and uh, renal stones do not uh, happen in this. No, I mean, there is no connection at all. May not be. Yeah. Thank you. The patients are reported with a chronic kidney failure. Mm. More than uh, actually it is very high. I am going to present next lecture. And we found cadmium and lead. Sir? Cadmium and lead. Oh, yeah. And the cadmium was detected in the phosphate manual. Which which attach which adds on the clay land and go to the drinking water. Half life of cadmium kidney is twenty four years. We have a question from the house. In an era of increasing number of super special super specialists and nephrologists, how do you see the role of a family physician? Managing so what you said now is for family physicians only. I have not said anything that uh, is pertaining to nephrology. It is all related to only community health workers and family physicians. Uh, we come in only when you need an expert opinion on something that uh, is at a secondary or a tertiary level. Yeah. Uh, I, I worked in Bisham Katak and now I am working in Daman. So both the places I am seeing yeah. same CKDU of same yeah. Uh, in between 20 to 30 years coming, uh, males more uh, prominently coming uh, with CKDU. So, uh, and also the Sri Lankan study you said where, where glyophosate was mm -hmm. uh, seen to be associated. So, is it possible that different regions have different, different etiological factors for CKDU? Yeah, yeah, there could be a main contributor factor in uh, uh, different regions, which is not the same. Yeah, but uh, like right now in Daman and then Surat and then whole that... Uh, where many industries are there, even the villages. And uh, I I was thinking to do some studies on it, yeah, but I'm not uh, understanding that where to start about finding the etiological region because there's so, so it's much. It's very difficult to have a cause. Many studies have been done looking at uh, attributing a cause to this disease. And I think you should uh, more focus on identifying the hotspot rather than go in uh, finding the cause. Once you identify the hotspot and then you determine the various possible etiologies in that region and address them as a whole, that itself will uh, decrease the burden. Just one more question, uh, Sushina. That is, is there a role or a link between tuberculosis and CKDU? Uh, not so far. Not so far. There have been people, uh, there have been research into leptospirosis and CKDU, hantavirus and CKDU, but not so far uh, in TB. 
this is not a question, but just to add on, uh, Government of Tamil Nadu with Institute of Nephrology in Madras Medical College, they we did have, a, a survey, I mean, a, a community-based survey with regards to CKD, and we found that across Tamil Nadu, it was done across Tamil Nadu, and we found that 9% uh, was the uh, CKD prevalence in Tamil Nadu. And of that, 53% did not have diabetes or hypertension. And following which currently we are now doing a work on CKDU among agricultural laborers. Uh, first uh, part of the survey is over and we are able to find uh, uh, the uh, probable CKD. We are able to find the difference in terms of geographical regions. The southern districts have like 30 percentage with probable CKD and the uh, northern districts have uh, 10 percentage. So uh, the role of climate on CKD should also be thought of and we are also planning to uh, look for lepto uh, in the uh, patients who have been identified as CKDU. So just to add on to yeah, what yeah. it. Interesting. That's great. Uh, there's no more questions. We'll close the session. Thank you, Sushina, for the talk. We would like to especially thank Dr. Sushina Alexander and Dr. Vinoy David for moderating this session. We request Dr. Vinoy to please to please felicitate Dr. Sushina Alexander on behalf of the department. Thank you very much.